Yeah, Kennedy. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have uh, a letter here in support of Judge Barrett, signed by 281 graduates and former classmates of hers at the extraordinary St. Mary's Dominican High School in New Orleans. And I'd like to offer that into the record. Without objection. You tired, Judge? I'm looking forward to the end of the uh, hearing today, I must admit. Me too. <laughs> I'm still going to ask you questions. I was hoping you'd say you were going to yield your time, Senator. No, ma'am. A lot of my colleagues and you as well, have talked about the oath that you will take if you're confirmed and sworn in as an Associate Justice of the United States Supreme Court. What's in that oath? What's it say? Well, that oath requires a judge, you know, I've taken the oath as a judge, to do equal justice to all, you know, without fear or favor, you know, regardless of wealth. Um, you know, to, to fairly apply the law is what it boils down to, to not give preferential treatment or express bias in plain terms. It says you'll administer the law in an impartial manner without regard to your personal feelings, doesn't it? Yes, it does, Senator. It says you will support and defend the Constitution, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Um, pretty serious oath, isn't it? It is. Uh, are you going to uh, take that oath and affirm it if you're confirmed? Yes. You're not lying. I'm not lying. I took that oath before I began as a judge on the Seventh Circuit, and I have not violated that oath, and I would take it again, and oaths are serious to me. Well, now, Senator Harris just called you a liar. She said that if you take that oath, you'll be lying that you've already made up your mind and how you're going to vote on some cases, particularly dealing with, with abortion and the Affordable Care Act. Let's just cut to the chase. She said you're a liar. Are you a liar? I am not a liar, Senator Kennedy. All right, I want you to tell me again. Look me in the eye. You're in front of God and country. If you take that oath, will you mean it? I will mean it. If I take that oath, I will mean it. You swear to God? I swear to God. And you'll, I have sworn at the Seventh Circuit, and I meant it there, too. You'll never break that oath. I will not break that oath. No matter what your personal feelings are. No matter what my personal feelings No matter what your religion is. No matter what my religion is. So when Senator Harris and her colleagues say you're a liar, they're wrong. They are. All right, let's see. You're 48 years old. You're an honors graduate of Rhodes College, an extraordinary liberal arts school. You're an honor gra honors graduate of Notre Dame Law School. Uh, you clerked for two distinguished federal judges. You've been a chaired law professor. You've, uh, you're a devout Christian. You've raised seven children. I don't mean to wax too metaphysical here, but do you have personal values as a result of this? I would hope that no one would consider me to be nominated for anything if I had no values. Do you have uh, personal opinions? Of course, I have personal opinions. Do you have principles? I have principles. It wouldn't be fit for office if I didn't. Let's suppose that uh, we had a nominee appear before us. It happens to be a man in my hypothetical. And he said, uh, I've been nominated for a federal judgeship, and I finished law school, but I hadn't cracked a law book since law school, since uh, civil procedure. And... Uh, I don't have any opinions. I don't have any principles. Um, I don't read newspapers. I don't even read the news. I hadn't read a book since law school. Um, 
I'm like Bluto in Animal House. I'm just <laughs> fat, drunk, and, and, and stupid. Uh, I think, I think uh, the Germans are the ones who bombed Pearl Harbor. I think, uh, I think climate change, I think it didn't cause the Cold War. But I'm your guy because I don't have any value. I'm a blank slate. And that's what require, is required, isn't it, for me to be impartial? Do you think we ought to confirm that gentleman? Well, then Chief Justice Rehnquist wrote an opinion on this issue um, and addressing recusal. And he said, basically, that if someone reached middle years, which one is basically middle-aged, if one would be a justice on the Supreme Court, and had a mind that was a blank slate, and had no opinions, then one would question such a person's fitness for office. Well, my colleagues seem to think you, you're only qualified if you're, if you're dumb, if you have a blank slate, if you've never thought about the world. You've thought about the world, haven't you? I indeed have. Have you thought about a social problems facing our world? I have thought about social problems facing our world. Economic problems? Sure. I, I don't want to know uh, what, what your feelings are, but uh, uh, have you thought about uh, the merits and or lack thereof of nuclear energy? Um, no, I really haven't. How about affirmative action? That one. Have you thought about that as, just as a sure. subject? Yeah, yeah, I've thought about it. How about climate change? I mentioned climate change. Have you read about that? I've read about climate change. And you have some opinions on climate change that you've thought about? Uh, you know, I'm certainly not a scientist. I'm not saying you are. I mean, I, I've read things about climate change, I would not say that I have firm views on it. How, how about, have you thought about uh, um, the merits of a flat versus progressive income tax? I have thought fleetingly about that. Yeah. <laughs> These aren't things that I, you know, I'm not a tax lawyer or an I'm not trying to trap you. Uh, trap sure. Um, How about Justice Kagan? I've always been impressed with her credentials. Um, graduate of Princeton, did an MPhil at Oxford. I think she went to Harvard Law, was dean of Harvard Law School. She was. You think she's thought about the world? I'm sure she has, and I, too, am very impressed with Justice Kagan. Yeah, me too. You think she's thought about climate change and has personal feelings? I don't know. I mean, probably, but I can't really say what, you know, Justice Kagan has thought or not about. Okay. Now, you have personal feelings about abortion, don't you? Um, I do have personal feelings about abortion. Do you have personal feelings? Have you ever thought about how we deliver health care in this country? I do, but Senator Kennedy, one of the things about the judicial role that I've repeatedly emphasized in the hearing today is that I've got personal views and personal feelings on a range of matters, just like every human does and just like every judge or justice on the court does. Well, that's what I'm getting at. Now, my colleagues say, and Senator Harris said, that even though you have a personal opinion about abortion, that you will violate your oath to put aside those personal feelings and fairly decide abortion cases. Is that true? That, I gather, was the thrust of what she was saying to me, yes. Is she right? No, she's not right. Um, well, let's talk about the Affordable Care Act. It's going to, you know, California v. Texas. Mm -hmm. You've thought about the delivery of health care. Yes. you got seven children. S spent a lot of time. You've probably been to an emergency care. room. Yes. Um, you, formed, you, you, you formed opinions about the delivery of health care. Are, are you going to, do, should you recuse yourself? Well, Senator Kennedy, any opinions that I have, everyone has opinions. Every, any opinions that I have are just not relevant to the resolution of the case. Right. Affordable Care Act case or anything else. And a lot of my opinions, you know, are not ones that are expert, for example, in scientific matters or taxing matters. I mean, I have, might have dinner table discussions, but I don't purport to be an expert in any of those fields. Well, I'm, I'm going to hit this one on another lick now, because this is serious. Okay. Some of my colleagues in Senator Harris say you're lying. Are you lying? I'm not lying. Are you going to take that oath and abide by it? Yes, sir. Will you ever break that oath? I will not break that oath, Senator Kennedy. Okay. Now, one of my colleagues, I don't remember which one, 
said that uh, because President Trump appointed you, or nominated you rather, that if there's a, a, a case that happens to go before the United States Supreme Court after you're confirmed dealing with the upcoming election, they ask you to recuse yourself. Remember that question? Mm-hmm. Um, and you said you would go through the process. Of determining right. the recusal question. But you yes. didn't commit to recusing yourself until you, uh, at, in one way or the other. You said you'd go through the process. I said I would go through the process. I committed to going through the process of determining whether to recuse. But okay. I did not commit to it. When, 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 now, pr President Trump nominated uh, Judge Kavanaugh, now Justice Kavanaugh, in the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. Did anybody ask him to recuse himself when the president's tax returns were before the court? I don't know. Uh, Justice Gorsuch was nominated by President Trump and, and confirmed by the Senate. Did anybody ask him? to recuse himself when I, President Trump's uh, tax returns were before the court? I don't know if any motions were filed. Do you know who Paula Jones is? I do. Okay. She sued the President of the United States, didn't she? She sued President Clinton. Yeah. Clinton v. Jones. Famous case. Um, President Clinton nominated Justice Ginsburg and Justice Breyer to the United States Supreme Court. They heard that case. Did anybody ask that Justice Ginsburg recuse herself because President Clinton nominated her? I don't know if any motions were filed. You think she should have? Well, that's not something I would opine on. I'm sure that she discharged her oath to consider the question. Did any of my colleagues ask that uh, Justice Breyer recuse himself from hearing Clinton v. Jones because President Clinton had appointed him? I don't think that's come up. In the yeah, I don't think so either. All right, I, I'm going to finish this housekeeping because I want to talk about the law. I want to give you a chance to respond to something. Some butthead professor at Boston University says that because you and your husband have two children of color, that you're a white colonist. The implication is that you're a racist and that you use your two children as props. Do you use your children as props? Senator Kenny, it was the risk of people saying things like that, which would be so hurtful to my family, that when I told Senator Graham this morning that my husband and I had to really weigh the costs of this, it was saying deeply offensive and hurtful things, things that are not only hurtful to me, but are hurtful to my children, who are my children, who we love, and who we brought brought home and made part of our family, and accusations like that are cruel. Yeah, they are, aren't they? How low can you go? I didn't want to ask that question when your kids were here. I'm sorry I have to go through that. Okay, let's talk about the law. <laughs> uh... Let's suppose, I don't, I'm not going to ask you how you're going to rule on a case. Okay. Be, and you can't, couldn't answer anyway. You'd violate the judicial canons of ethics. I don't know what ha would happen to you, but it'd probably be pretty bad. Because uh, you're, you're a sitting judge. You're on the I Seventh Circuit. Judge. But, but let's, so, let's suppose that, that a litigant, that, let's suppose Congress passed a statute making distinctions on the basis of wealth. Okay. And uh, somebody filed a lawsuit and said that their argument is that wealth is a suspect classification. How, do you, how are you going to analyze a case like that? Tell me, tell me how you'd analyze it. I just want to know how you think. Sure. Well, if someone argued that wealth was a suspect classification, I assume you're saying that they're probably making an equal protection claim. Yep. So I would go to precedent would be the first source because the equal protection clause um, has a rich body of precedent under it that identifies suspect classes. For example, classes drawn on the basis of race are suspect, and they get heightened scrutiny. So I would look through Supreme Court precedent to determine whether there was anything relevant to the question of whether wealth was a suspect class or not. OK. You're familiar with San Antonio School District v. Rodriguez? Mm. 
My mind's getting mushy this many hours into the hearing, so you might need to refresh Well, let me put it another way. Well, it's not a suspect classification, is it? Um, I am not aware of a case saying that wealth would be a suspect yeah. classification. Well, here, here's what I don't understand. I've always wondered about this. Okay, this is, remember, this is Congress passing the statute, not some state. So, so the litigant is, is not pursuing this under the 14th Amendment. He's pursuing it under, or she, under the Fifth Amendment. And um, he's making a substantive, well, he's, no, he's making an equal protection argument, not substantive due process. That would be a fundamental right. Where does the where does the Fifth Amendment mention equal protection? Um, well, the Fifth Amendment has a due process clause. But I know. The Fifth Amendment doesn't, but the Supreme but, but the Fourteenth Amendment has a due process clause and an and equal, equal protection. protection clause. But the fifth, which applies to the states, but the Fifth Amendment clause, Fifth Amendment uh, uh, to the Constitution has a due process clause, but it doesn't say a word about equal protection. That's true, but the Supreme Court has interpreted it as applying the Equal Protection Clause as well against the How can they do that if the words aren't there? Well, there was a case, um, I believe the case in which the court addressed this was the one that addressed the constitutionality of segregation in the District of Columbia, which is governed by federal law. Um, and the court said the same principle applies. And so essentially, the reasoning of Brown applied there. OK, I remember that. All right, let's talk about Heller. Senator Craypill talked about it a little bit. I went back and took a look at Heller. Scalia wrote, you know this better than I do, Scalia wrote the majority opinion. I think Stevens wrote the leading dissent. And, and it was interesting, they both took an originalist approach. And I went back and looked it up. Scalia relied on, and, and, a, and a, tell me what, what an originalist approach is again. I know there are different strains, but what's your strain? Sure. You take the Constitution. So in Heller, for example, what Justice Scalia did, and, and this is an example of originalism, he went back to the time of the ratification of the Second Amendment to figure out whether when people, when that amendment was ratified, whether that right to bear arms was considered to be an individual right mm -hmm. or one that was a civic Excuse right. Excuse me for interrupting, but considered by whom? Considered by the people. The people. By the people at the time, not in the minds of the framers, but okay. by the people. Okay, I, I went back and looked. I'm sorry. No, no, no. I'm, I've had a little coffee. I'm kind of jacked <laughs> up. Um, I went back and looked, looked it up. Scalia, he relied on, to reach his opinion, he relied on founding era dictionaries, founding era treatises, English laws, American colonial laws, British and American historical documents, colonial era state constitutions, post-enactment commentary, all on the Second Amendment. And then here comes Justice Stevens. He's dissenting. He relied on, in his dissent, he relied on linguistic professors, an 18th century treatise on synonymous words, a, a, on a different editor of one of the same colonial era dictionaries on which Scalia relied. So they, they both went back and looked at history. Here's my question. Since when did justices become historians? Let me put it another way. If this is the way we're going to interpret the Constitution, by looking at history, why do we need you guys? Why don't we just hire professional historians? Well... So justices and judges interpret laws, and we interpret texts. And if texts are unclear, you have to figure out what their meaning is, right? And so with the Constitution, sometimes that does require delving into history. One point that I think is worth, uh, Justice Scalia would make this point, that the alternative is, let's say you have um, an amendment like the Second Amendment's right to bear arms. If it's not evident, looking at it, whether it's an individual right or a collective right for the sake of the militia, um, one approach would be to rely on the moral judgment of the judge, of the justice, say whether they think it's a good thing or a bad thing for the common good for people to have that individual right. And of course, judges aren't moral philosophers either. So when you're interpreting a text and you need to turn to something, what judges know is words and what judges know is law. And so... Having them go back and look at the history, those are 
familiar things to lawyers. And they're things that all justices consider. As I said earlier in the hearing, all justices do consider the history and the original meaning. And that's been true since the beginning of the court itself. Throughout the 19th century, this idea of originalism isn't new. So throughout the 19th century, you know, throughout the 20th, the court has resorted back and looked to see what the original meaning is. Um, it's just that, I would say, the difference between those who identify themselves as you know, originalists and those who just consider it is the amount of weight that they give it. So all judges have to be skilled in, in doing it to a degree because everyone agrees that as a matter of law, the original meaning matters. Tell me what the Ninth Amendment means. Um, well, the Ninth Amendment was once famously described by Judge Bork as an inkblot. Um, the Ninth Amendment has not been fleshed out in litigation. I don't think it's an inkblot, just to be clear. <laughs> um, but it's not one that, that there's a whole lot of case law on. I want to talk to you a little bit about originalism, or at least your strain of originalism, and how it's, how it's related to, uh, to uh, textualism and how it's different from, uh, from uh, purposivism. Um, did I understand you correctly to say that an originalist believes that judges have to follow the original public meaning of the Constitution? Correct. The original public meaning. Public meaning as distinguished from private intentions of those who drafted the document. Okay. Does this mean, when you say original public meaning, Whose meaning? The average person in the community at that time? Well, we would say informed observers. So I'm sorry? I would say informed observers. Like, so those who were familiar with the debates, which is why looking at the state ratifying conventions, um, debating the Constitution can be a fruitful source. Is it OK? I know it's not OK to, to do it exclusively, but is it OK to consider what the drafters thought? Sure, and you know James Madison's notes from the Constitutional Convention are a source that the court routinely looks to in trying to determine original meaning. It's just that it's not conclusive. What's the dimension of time? I mean, it, at what point in time do you look at the original public meaning? Well, I would say there's some debate about that because you know you won't necessarily have all the evidence you need right from 1791, which is when the Bill of Rights, as you know, was ratified. You know, I think looking at the evidence from before that, so we see that in Heller, um, that Justice Scalia looked at how people understood that right all the time leading up to the ratification of the Second Amendment because it cast light on the language people were speaking at the time and how they would have understood it. So you definitely can look some before. Okay. Excuse me for interrupting, yeah, but my sure. clock's running. Okay. Is it, if, you, if you look at 10 years after the Constitution was adopted, is that okay? How about well, 20? I, I think it's, I think all of that can be relevant evidence. I think the farther that you get away from the ratification of the document, then I think the dicier it gets. Because we might say that, you know, well, with, between 1791 and, you know, 1801, that people had roughly the same understanding. But of course, as time passes, you know, then attitudes can change. So I wouldn't say that there's a firm cutoff. But I think it's clearly the case that the evidence that's closer to the time is the most probative. OK, what's the difference between originalism and textualism? Well, textualism is a, how we describe a method of interpreting statutes. So it actually, in many respects, is kind of like originalism applied to a statute. So it would say you take statutory text, you know, um, you know, for the Clean Water Act or, you know, the makeup one, the, um, the Amy Barrett Act <laughs> passed today. You look at what the words would have meant to those who um, read the act at the time and verbs ob informed observers of the, of the debate. So you're looking at the ordinary meaning of the words. You're looking at the ordinary meaning of the words. The plain meaning of the words. The plain meaning of the words. What, what, if, uh, what, if, what if they're unclear? 
Um, well, there are a series of canons of interpretation um, that judges employ to decipher language. They're like linguistic tools. Like sometimes a list means the expression of some things implies the exclusion no, of I'm others. I'm familiar with all those. You, you know them better than I do. But, but if, if, if the statute's unclear, if there is no ordinary meaning, meaning can you look at legislative history? Um, generally, I think that legislative history is a less fruitful source um, because generally when people make arguments about legislative history, they tend to be less about what a word meant and how a statute would apply to a certain circumstance, which is a little bit different. But if it's amb ambiguous, you can look at legislative history as a last resort. You can look at legislative history to determine whether there was a particular understanding of a word or a phrase. But I think it would be, um, in most cases, inadvisable to look at legislative history to make a determination, certainly not to treat it as binding, about how a statute would apply to a particular set of facts. Okay, well, well how, how ambiguous, a, a, a lot of textualists say, if, it's, if, it, if, it's, if the statute's ambiguous, if it's unclear, mm -hmm. then I can consider secondary sources. How ambiguous does it have to be? 51%? 65%? How do you know how ambiguous? Well, it's not it a precise. It, it's an art, not a science. I would say, Senator Kennedy. Um, you know, you exhaust all the canons of interpretation, and that includes even ones that are not the grammatical canons, but are like the avoidance canon. You run through all of those, and then you look at the structure of the statute. And I mean, I think deciding when something crosses the threshold and becoming ambiguous so you can consider canons like the rule of lenity or the avoidance canon, you know, that that's a very difficult question. And it's part of the debate about the Chevron doctrine. Okay. Um, you're familiar with the term uh, purposivist? Yes. Okay. I think, tell me, you correct me now, a purposivist says, look, I look at the statute uh, even, even if it's clear. I can still look at secondary sources and try to figure out what problem the legislative body was trying to solve. That is so, yes. A purpose of this would say that to be faithful to Congress would be to be faithful to the purpose of the statute. Yeah. Um, and that sometimes the text doesn't align exactly with the purpose and that in that circumstance, the judge should go with the purpose rather than the text. Now, everybody's a, a textualist now, or an originalist. Um, but really, aren't, aren't a lot of our textualists really purposivists? In other words, they go, well, I looked at the language of the statute. It's unclear. So I checked off the originalist, or, te or rather textualist box, and now I can just go look at what problem Congress is trying to decide and do whatever the hell I want to do. There has been um, some academic commentary, definitely in the last five or 10 years, saying that that's become kind of the new strain of textualism. You might know the case Holy Trinity. Yeah. Yeah, calling it the it's new. It's been overruled, though, hasn't it? Um, Holy Trinity, you mean its approach to statutory interpretation the and its yes. endorsement? Yeah. No, it's never been overruled, but it's fallen out of favor. But. This idea of doing what you're saying, stretching to find ambiguity in text, the argument that some make is that it's kind of a new form of holy trinity because rather than saying that the text is clear but inconsistent with the purpose, the argument is that um, the purpose renders the text unclear. All right, let me ask you a couple more. Um, I want to talk about a state constitution. In Louisiana, we had a... a Constitutional Convention in 1973, we wrote a new state constitution. And we recorded everything. We got, uh, I think, 14 volumes of transcripts, committee reports, anything you could possibly want to know about the drafting of the 1974 Louisiana Constitution. You're an originalist. Are you telling me to just throw all that stuff out? No, those things would be the equivalent of looking at James Madison's notes from the Constitutional Convention or the state ratifying conventions. All those things shed light on what Louisianians were thinking when that Constitution was drafted and ratified. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I want the record to reflect that I landed this plane with 26 seconds left. 
So noted. Thank you very much, Senator Kennedy.